thank you for thank you for resuming. Okay, we're gonna talk we're gonna talk money the next go round. So you know you can check your bank account and your balances now, so you know where to deposit. But remember, the best place to deposit your money in New York is clearly with the Libertarian Party of New York. So we'll definitely we'll definitely talk about money soon. Okay, I'm very excited about our next speaker. Karen Strawn has come here from Alberta. So, you know, I came all the way from Manhattan. She came all the way from faraway province in Western uh, Canada to be with us. And Karen is doing something very different than many people in her area. She's in an area, particularly with, with uh, discussing issues about radical feminism and, and gender politics. And as we all know, that is a na that's an area that's been co-opted by the left almost exclusively. And when the right-wingers talk about it, it's all, oh, well, you know, they belong in a house, you know, making babies or whatever. So, you know, that, that, that gets us nowhere either. But Karen is in a particularly wonderful niche. She's talking about gender politics from a pro-freedom point of view. And that is really a wonderful thing to do. So I'm looking forward, and I'm sure we all are, to hearing from Karen Strawn. Thank you. Okay, can, can you all hear me? All right. Um, just a few things that I wanted to say. Uh, thanks to uh, Gary for inviting me here. And I'd like to thank all of you here as well for uh, keeping an open mind. Uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about might seem a little bit crazy, might seem a little offensive even, but uh, if... Hmm? You're in the right place. There you go. If, if you hear me out, you might get your back up a little at first, but if you hear me out through the whole thing, I'm hoping to present a, a different point of view, a different angle for all of you to be able to look at gendered issues, in particular uh, ideological feminism and the influence that it has had on public policy and uh, the legal system, especially in the areas of family law and domestic violence law. So, um, and maybe you're all asking yourselves, what does gender have to do with libertarian politics and libertarian philosophies? And you know, the answer to that is complex, but also really, really simple. Gender influences everything, everything, uh, especially the size, scope, and decisions of government. Um, on the micro scale, gender will affect the way men and women think, how they feel, how they process their interactions with the world, what motivates them, what influences them, uh, what's important to them, and what incentives are going to affect their behavior and how. Uh, it affects how we perceive other people depending on whether they're male or female. It impacts on what we feel is appropriate uh, re regarding the behaviors, responsibilities, and uh, roles we expect of others and the ones that we expect of ourselves. Uh, it affects what roles and vocations on average a given person is going to find themselves suited to or interested in. And uh, on the macro scale, gender affects the way society feels about people, depending on whether they're male or female. Uh, what expectations society has of them, what obligations society is prepared to place on them, uh, how and how much society is going to care about them. Uh, it affects, uh, it influences whose voices society is prepared to trust on what issues, and affects society's willingness to punish or forgive, uh, who society is interested in holding responsible or accountable for wrongs done, who society is prepared to devote resources to help and protect, and who society is prepared to cut loose. So gender is kind of a shortcut that societies and governments use when sorting priorities. Who's deserving of our help, protection, and support, socially, legally, and governmentally, and who's less deserving or maybe not deserving at all? You know, how should that help be implemented? How should it not? Uh, how much are we willing to spend? Uh, how much institutional power and scope should government have to involve itself in the lives of its citizens? And, uh, you know, in order to demonstrate the effect of gender on how we think, and the way we react to things. I'm just gonna quote, a, make a few quotes. These are probably quotes that you have heard uh, from Barack Obama, from Hillary Clinton, and I'm gonna switch the genders and see how you feel about that. Men can do anything women can, and do it better, 
and do it with one hand tied behind their backs. Uh, when a woman strikes a man, she strikes all of society. Uh, here's one from a poster campaign. I flipped the genders in the situation a little. Women can stop false allegations of abuse and rape. That's from a Men Can Stop Rape poster campaign that's all over campuses in the US and Canada. Uh, this is an especially wonderful one from UK Equalities Minister Harriet Harman. It cannot be assumed that women are bound to be an asset to family life or that the presence of mothers in families is necessarily a means to social cohesion. Now, can you imagine a politician surviving on the podium for even a minute after they said that? But she said exactly that about fathers. Uh, or how about this one? Uh, a mall roof caved in yesterday, killing 23 people and injuring more than 100. Tragically, four men and one child were among the dead. <laughs> it, it, it just seems absurd. It seems absurd. Uh, and this one from 1600, right? The year 1600, published in a book by Lucrezia Marinella in Italy. It is an amazing thing to see in our city the husband of a laundress or a fishwife or a housemaid dressed in velvet with chains of gold at the throat, with silver buckles and boots of good value, and then in contrast to see his wife washing the clothes, chapped and bedraggled from the day's labor, poorly dressed. But whosoever considers this carefully will find it reasonable, because it is necessary that the gentleman, even if low-born and humble, uh, be arrayed in such fine form for his natural excellence and dignity, and the woman be less adorned as if a slave or a little ass born to his service." Now, that was written up about men by a woman and published in the year 1600. And you would never, ever get away with saying anything like that about women even now. This was, this was with the gender switch, with the gender switch. She was talking about men being uh, like a slave or an ass born to her service. They were, uh, but we're talking, she was talking about the husbands of, uh, the, the wives of porters or butchers. Right. Even they should be finely dressed for their natural dignity and excellence, even if humbly born. So uh, these are statements you'd never really hear or read in mainstream culture, uh, not even in the year 1600. Uh, some because they'd be repulsive to us, and others because it would just never occur to us to think or feel in that way. And that's all because of the way we as humans perceive and have always perceived men and women. And while feminism claims to have worked very hard to dismantle all of these individual and society-wide assumptions about men and women, if you scratch the surface of their ideologies and their efforts, what you mostly find is all of those assumptions human societies have always held dialed up to 11. Not only has feminist activism manipulated and exploited all of these age-old perceptions about gender for political, legal, economic, and social gain, it's only amplified them in the cultural zeitgeist. It's very much a case of say hello to the new bo boss, even more sexist than the old boss. Now, I've been asked before to sort of describe what it is I do. Uh, I do video lectures, I blog, I, you know, I, I discuss things, I'm an activist. Um, you know, I am an advocate for the issues of men and boys, uh, in, especially in the West, uh, but I'm also an anti-feminist. And my task, as I see it, is to try to dig under the surface and uncover the real nature of things and maybe deprogram as many people as I can manage to do, you know, to, to encourage them to think from a different angle, to entertain thoughts that are forbidden in our politically correct culture, to educate as many as I can about the hidden nature of society, gender, and especially ideological feminism. And uh, among those of us uh, who talk about these kinds of things, uh, we call it taking the red pill. It, it, it represents a complete flipping of how you, how you think about things. And why am I hoping to convince libertarians to think from that different angle? Uh, there's a strong libertarian streak that runs right down the center of the men's movement. 
and uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, Canadian libertarian philosopher Stéphane Molyneux, Stéphane Molyneux once called feminism socialism in panties. And uh, I'm pretty sure most of the men here would be able to attest that, that anything, no matter how destructive or unprincipled, is probably going to look more appealing and less sinister if it has a female face and you put it in some panties. So I'm not going to bore you with like a really detailed history of the marriage of feminism and Marxism. Uh, for that, I would refer any who are interested after the, the talk uh, to uh, a lengthy but fascinating lecture series by Soviet expatriate Valdis Analaskas, uh, who describes the courtship between the two ideologies that began in the mid-1800s and has now become the foundation of feminist thought. I'll simply note that Karl Marx, in his Communist Manifesto, emphasized how very important women would be to any communist revolution and that the best way to secure the support of women would be to convince them of the plural nature of their oppression. As workers, they were oppressed by the elites, and as women, they were oppressed by their husbands, fathers, and even sons. Um, though radical feminism has never severed its ties with Marxism and communism, as early as the 1920s, feminism had essentially co-opted and repurposed Marxist theory to describe the structure of society relating to the interaction of the sexes. The intellectual backlash against feminism that began within the Marxist community around the turn of the 20th century with E. Belfort Bax and Robert Refault was quashed through intimidation, censorship, and the use of emotionally charged propaganda. By the 1960s, when the Western world's love affair with communism had begun to fizzle, communism's red-headed stepdaughter, feminism, was only growing in popularity. The sexier, less threatening, more benign-seeming Trojan mare upon which Marxists had relied to sneak their ideolo ideology past the gates of the Western world had outgrown its helpmeet role and taken on a life of its own. By this era, a discrete and quintessentially Marxist theoretical model of gender had become entrenched in the intellectual sphere, a model based on class conflict theory and postmodern discourse. While communist thought was confined to a small pocket of what the mainstream mostly thought of as misguided weirdos, feminist thought, slapped together from the exact same bricks and mortar, became not only fashionable, but had spawned its own branch of academia, sponsored and enabled by unwitting democratic governments across the West. While historical views on the sexes had maintained that men and women were distinctly different but complementary partners, role mates, as War Dr. Warren Farrell has described them, this new feminist model cast all aspects of society as oppressive and exploitive systems wherein men embodied the bourgeoisie and women the proletariat. Most of this model, the patriarchy, and its sub-theories are little more than post hoc rationalizations based on emotional reasoning, uh, easily swallowed by the well-meaning public because of the evidence that stands out most starkly to us given our natural evolved views of gender. Humans have always been more emotionally reactive to the harms, injuries, injustices, complaints, and perils that affect women, and more likely to see women as nurturing, benign, kind, well-meaning, and deserving of protection. We have always been more likely to see men as strong, sturdy, capable of self-sufficiency, potent, and potentially threatening. And those perceptions inform our reactions when men suffer harms, injuries, injustices, and dangers, and when they dare, dare to complain about them. Because of these innate perceptions, when feminists pointed up toward the top of society and showed us mostly men, we didn't bother to direct our attention down to the bottom of society so we could see the mostly men there as well. We all saw a glass ceiling, but not a glass cellar and allowed feminists to convince us that all aspects of society, the formalized and the informal, were male-dominated and male-controlled, and that women as a class were utterly powerless and subjugated under this system. Marriage was redefined under this model, from a partnership where both parties contributed and benefited to a form of sexual slavery and unpaid drudgery for women, where wives were subjugated and exploited for their husband's express benefit. 
Under second wave feminism, family was reinterpreted as an institution based on exploitation instead of all members working together for the benefit and shared success of all members. Uh, women were recast as powerless subordinates providing unreciprocated labor uh, toward the raising of his children and the keeping of his house. Labor that freed husbands to pursue economic and social power outside the home. It didn't matter that most men had little more access to economic and social power than most women, or that what power men achieved, they were expected to share equitably with their families. Feminists were too busy pointing upward at the congressmen, bank managers, and CEOs, and crying injustice to show us the taxi drivers, garbage men, plumbers, loggers, fishermen, miners, construction workers, factory laborers, field workers, roughnecks, and janitors. They, were, they envied the power of generals and statesmen, but spared no thought for the thousands of young foot soldiers dead in trenches. They were jealous of the self-determination that made an industrialist rich beyond dreaming, but when that same self-determination produced a different outcome for the mostly male population of tramps, beggars, and hobos, it was invisible to them. They focused solely on the men above them and did not even notice the men below. The 23 cent average apples to oranges annual wage gap is still in their minds the height of sexist injustice, but the 94% workplace death gap, well, who cares? Traditional ways of providing for and protecting women that were necessary in the pre-industrial past were reinterpreted by feminism as male oppressors keeping women down all through history for men's benefit. Domestic violence, a social problem that has always been gender symmetrical, became synonymous with violence against women. A husband's historical right to conjugal relations was redefined as marital rape, while a wife's identical right, one that for centuries, if denied, was legal grounds for divorce and could even get a man excommunicated from his church, well, that part of history was erased from modern scholarship even as it is upheld and reinforced by feminist activism. In fact, according to current feminist theories on domestic violence, a man withholding sex or affection from his wife, whatever the reason, is committing domestic abuse. And incidentally, a man in France was recently ordered to pay $10,000 in punitive damages to his ex-wife for not giving her enough sex during their marriage. The traditional obligation of a woman to defer to her husband's authority was defined as oppression. But her husband's obligation to die in a trench to protect his country and his family, that was redefined as male privilege. And when enough people protested the hubris of that assertion, it became patriarchy hurts men too. Under the patriarchy, all men are privileged by their maleness and all women oppressed by their femaleness. And if men are, as a class, the privileged bourgeoisie, if men hold collective power over society, then all men are culpable for the oppression and exploitation of all members of the female proletariat. This is collectivism at its finest. And any discrimination a man might face in society is just his own privilege backfiring on him. According to radical feminists, the drastic technological and economic changes that occurred during the last century or more, medical advances that virtually eliminated deaths in childbirth, drastically decreased infant and child mortality, mortality rates, changes that rendered the workplace as safe and comfortable as your living room, safe and reliable birth control, industrialization, automation, prosperity, plenty, and an unprecedented level of personal, individual, physical safety. None of this had anything to do with the gains women have made. Even prior to these changes, they said, during a history in which a woman might spend half her adult life pregnant or nursing children, where most labor was backbreaking, dangerous, and simply beyond the physical capabilities of women, where life was often brutal and brief, and where men bore a legally enforceable obligation to provide for the material needs of all family members, 
The fact that men bore economic authority along with all the economic burdens of a family was a system specifically designed to dis disempower women. According to radical feminists, your grandfathers and great-grandfathers were rapists and slave owners who exploited, subjugated, and violated the women who were nearest and dearest to them, their own wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters. According to radical feminists, every atrocity ever committed throughout all of history can be laid at the door of normal masculinity. Every male-generated advance, however, calculus, alternating current, the telegraph, the transistor, radio, penicillin, the number system, hydroelectricity, microwaves, fiberglass, the theory of relativity, the periodic table, trigonometry, insulin, canned foods, vaccines, fire retardant, Teflon, wireless communications, the microchip, the birth control pill, and even tampons. All of that is a result of men intentionally holding women back, keeping women down, refusing to allow women to achieve, and thereby hogging all the power and glory. You see how all that works. All the evils of history, committed mostly by men, are evidence of men's oppressive natures. And all the advances of civilization, because they have been generated almost exclusively by men, are equally evidence of men's oppressive natures. Even the exceptional and wonderful things men have given us that benefit us all, they are not evidence that men embody anything good. In fact, they demonstrate the opposite. They are evidence that the old boys club modern feminists complain about today dates all the way back to the Pleistocene, when women would have eagerly hunted Mastodon with babies strapped to their breasts <laughs> and carved back a jungle filled with leopards and bears if only men had not enslaved them and thereby deprived them of an opportunity to do so. This is what they believe. This is what ideological feminism is, not coffee shop feminism not the movement for political, social, and economic equality for women, but the belief system of ideological feminism. It describes women's experience through history as identical to the experience of blacks under slavery. You know, actual oppression. To clarify, what were the upsides to being black in America during slavery? Can anyone here name a single white slave owner who ever died to save the lives of his black slaves? Whoever gave up a space in a lifeboat to his black slave and chose himself to go down with a ship. Whoever stood with a rifle between his black slaves and an enemy to defend their lives rather than his right to own them. Can anyone even imagine a white slave owner working 16 hours in a field without sunscreen or bug spray while his black slave stayed inside most of the day, kept his house tidy, fed his children, and then came home and shared the fruits of his labors with his black slave? Did a black woman who was the sexual partner of a white slave owner have any expectation of respect, lifelong provision, protection, or shelter, or of sharing the benefits of his quality of life and his social status? Or was she just an object of the moment, free to be used and cast aside at will? Did a black man who was obligated to obey his owner's wife have any legal right or recourse when she pointed a finger and claimed he raped her? Or was he swinging from a tree within hours? Can anyone imagine a reality where a white slave owner would perform physically grueling or dangerous work because his black slave was incapable of it? Or would he simply set more slaves to the task, or work his slave to death, or discard his used up slave and buy a better one? If women were truly oppressed by men, would they have been spared the most onerous and dangerous work because they were less physically capable of it? Or would men have simply assigned more women to the task? Can anyone here name a single black person, man or woman, who rose to state-sanctioned power during slavery? Off the top of my head, I can name a whole bunch of women who have been heads of state going as far back as ancient Egypt. The greatest and most notable leaders emerging from Jim Crow America and apartheid South Africa rose to influence by opposing the government, not rising within it, because they had no avenue to power within a system that really oppressed them. Slavery and oppression are defined as obligation and disadvantage without compensatory benefit. Does anyone here think women who were a tiny minority 
tenths of a percent among the 10 million soldiers who died during World War I derived no benefit from the traditional system. One of the few ways, in fact, a man could duck conscription was to be married. A man could avoid mandatory military service if his wife would be inconvenienced by it. And yet this system existed to benefit men at the expense of women. A system of top-down oppression, according to feminists, that is no different from the experience of blacks under slavery. And if you perceive history and gender relations as being remotely similar to the history of slavery in the US, it's no shock to hear feminist Robin Morgan, editor of Ms. Magazine, claim, man-hating is an honorable and viable political act. The oppressed have a right to class hatred against their oppressors. Yet, as childish and simplistic and absurd as this model was, it wasn't long before it had become firmly entrenched in academia, in the humanities and the arts, in sociology, anthropology, psychology, history, women's studies and gender studies. The very faculties and programs most associated with <clears throat> education, social work, journalism, the law and political science. The very branches of society most able to influence public perception and with the greatest impact on people's lives. And because of all those things I was talking about at the beginning of this presentation, public perception was vulnerable to the half-truths presented to it that were disguised as the entire picture. And the really awesome thing about this model is that as long as enough people believe it, even just a little, as long as enough people can be convinced to see men as the bourgeoisie, who have always unjustly benefited from their exploitation of women, and women as the proletariat who have been forced to toil and slave without benefit under the boot heel of those privileged, oppressive men, you can justify anything. If men are believed to have always collectively held power and economic privilege through the enslavement of women, if all of men's authority since the dawn of time was ill-gotten through the unre unreciprocated exploitation and violation of women, then women are entirely justified in stealing it back and the state is justified in assisting them. It becomes acceptable, justifiable, and appropriate for women to expropriate men, men's undeserved and unearned power by any means necessary, including state coercion. And this attitude is not confined to family law, domestic violence law, and sexual assault law, the primary areas where men's interests conflict with women's, and where the state has been quietly at work eroding due process protections and equal treatment under the law, and building bloated and ravenous mechanisms that suck up dollars and power while curtailing civil liberties. It's everywhere. It informs economic policy and employment policy, health spending, criminal law, the whole shebang. According to Dr. Warren Farrell, the government has passed more laws to protect women in the workplace from dirty jokes than it has to protect men from injury and death due to faulty rafters on construction sites. And nearly everyone in society, especially women it seems, seems to feel this is an appropriate allocation of resources. One need only watch The Life of Julia. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Obama's most naked and blatant appeal to women, especially young single women. Julia has no father and no husband. She needs neither. The state will take care of her needs from birth to death and will support her when she decides to have a child of her own, a child that in Obama's narrative is also fatherless. The man in Julia's life, the one who will perform the roles, provision, protection, and support, historically performed by husbands, brothers, and fathers, is more powerful than any man she'll ever meet, more able to provide for her, and one she need make no compromises with. Julia will never have to pick up this man's dirty socks or put up with him snoring or farting in bed or consider his needs or provide him respect, love, or affection. He is the ultimate provider and the ultimate protector and he will ask nothing of her in return but her vote. And he'll give her all those benefits through a system that coerces net taxpayers and net tax generators of whom a disproportionate number are still men 
to surrender their productivity while offering them neither mutual benefit nor voluntary association. This feels right and just to feminists because the state is merely assisting Julia in stealing back what has always been wrongfully taken from women as a class by men as a class. This feels like a great deal to Julia since all she's done is replace a man with whom she would have been required to bargain freely with a state that provides her all the same benefits without the messy business of having to trade anything valuable for them. If women today in the West can be said to be married to the state, in a very real sense, men are married to it as well. And the obligations expected of them are the same as they always have been. In this marriage, men pay at least 75% of the tax revenue into the system and reap a disproportionately tiny percentage of its protections and benefits. In this marriage, the state enforces the obligations of husbandhood after divorce and the obligations of fatherhood even when men did not consent to become fathers and even when they are allowed no meaningful role in the lives of their children. In this marriage, the resources men put in are diverted toward additional protection of women through the erosion of men's legal protections and civil rights. In this marriage, men are expected to pay for a system that not only does not serve them when they need it, that not only offers little back to them, that has not only made a mockery of due process protections for them, but one that has even handicapped their ability to perform their obligations by favoring women in the prioritization of education and employment and by facilitating the removal of fathers from the lives of their children. The state is essentially forcing men to finance a system that disenfranchises them. And the state is essentially paying women to disenfranchise men and handicap their own children. Soci social responsibility is enforced on men through penalty of imprisonment, while for women, social irresponsibility means a check in the mail every month. A lot of people have wondered aloud why there aren't more female libertarians. I think one of the reasons might lie in a lack of incentive. Big government costs the vast majority of men their wealth, their civil rights, their autonomy, sometimes even their freedom. But for most women, big government represents an insurance policy and a perpetual subsidy of their personal choices, good or bad. Men pay, women benefit. If women sprinted down the aisle to offer their hands in marriage to the state, for men it was a shotgun wedding, coercive by its very nature. And the influence of radical ide ideological feminism on government and legal policy has ensured that this marriage will be as abusive as they come. When Gary told me about his experiences with family court and its affiliated agencies, I told him, if you weren't a libertarian before all this, I can certainly see why you're one now. What used to be a voluntarily accepted obligation on the part of men is now extracted from them at the point of a gun. And often, there is no way for them, no matter how well they comply, to avoid getting shot. One example of what men's tax dollars disproportionately support and which lies in direct opposition to the interests and rights of ordinary men. The uh, institutionalization of the Duluth model of domestic violence. This model is the feminist conceptual framework of family violence and it's one that has been discredited by hundreds of credible studies across cultures from the most modern Western democracies to countries like Jordan and Namibia. According to Duluth, family violence is overwhelmingly male perpetrated and is motivated by men's and women's relative positions in society, by male social and political dominance and the expectation of female subordination. A man who batters his wife is not just asserting his dominance over her, he is expressing normalized masculinity. Abuse and coercive control of women, according to this model, is not a pathology but a natural function of male identity within a patriarchal culture. Simply put, it's just what men do. Every piece of legislation, every government policy, and every publicly funded treatment program in the US regarding family violence, and the vast majority of them worldwide, employs this conceptual model. And that would be fine if it wasn't a load of hooey. 
as hundreds of studies demonstrate, in at least half of cases, partner violence is reciprocal. It involves men and women hitting each other, and what motivates both men and women is pretty much the same. Anger, poor conflict resolution skills, jealousy, a desire to discipline a partner, drug and alcohol problems, uh, external stresses such as poverty. Women are as likely as men to report abusing their partners for all of these reasons, and more likely to engage in coercive control of their male partner. More than that, they are more likely to be the one to initiate physical violence. And in cases of severe unilateral abuse against a nonviolent partner, women are the perpetrators up to 70% of the time. For every eight women <coughs> seriously injured by domestic violence, at least five men are also seriously injured. And perhaps most damningly, considering feminism's unwillingness to address or even admit to women's perpetration of violence, the number one predictor of serious domestic violence injury in women is their own initiation of violence. It is when men are hitting them back that women are most likely to be hurt. What all this means is that patriarchal terrorism, the Duluth model of intimate partner violence, is the most rare form of all. And yet the patriarchal terrorism paradigm informs all of our government-funded mechanisms for intervention and treatment. But it doesn't end there. At least 35% of spousal murders are men murdered by their female partners. I say at least because if a woman engages a hitman, boyfriend, or some other party to assist her in murdering her male partner, it's classified statistically not as a spousal homicide, but as a multiple perpetrator homicide. Because of this, there is no way to know how many men are killed by their female partners each year. More than this, women are the most likely demographic to perpetrate child abuse and neglect, even controlling for the greater time women spend with their children. And the majority of young children murdered are murdered by their mothers. Biological fathers are, in contrast, the least likely demographic to abuse or kill their own children, less likely than both biological mothers and stepfathers. Statistically, the environment in which a woman is most safe from violence is in a stable marriage. And the environment in which children are the most safe from violence is one in which their parents raise them within a stable family. Yet our entire system of family law and our entire response to domestic violence from the Violence Against Women Act to local police department policies is designed to encourage and facilitate family breakup, to favor sole maternal custody arrangements, and to protect children from the very people least likely to abuse them. Mandatory arrest policies coupled with predominant aggressor policies based on the Duluth model ensure that one, somebody's gonna get arrested in any domestic violence incident, and two, regardless of who was assaulting whom, the person arrested will almost always be the larger, stronger male partner, even if he didn't touch her. A judge in Florida recently estimated that 80% of all temporary restraining orders granted in the context of divorce or child custody cases requested almost entirely by women are either fraudulent or unfounded. Divorce lawyers have called false allegations of domestic and violence and child abuse, and the abuse of temporary restraining orders merely part of the gamesmanship of divorce. A method, 80% uh, was the estimate. Uh, part of the gamesmanship of divorce, a method by which a wife can secure automatic custody of both the children and the marital home and leave an ex-partner scrambling to defend himself, often without access to necessary documents or even a change of clothes. The average length of time it takes for a woman to obtain a temporary restraining order in an ex parte hearing is under three minutes. She need provide no evidence of prior abuse. All she has to tell the judge is that she feels afraid of her husband. The first any man might know that such an order has been issued is when the police arrive to remove him from his home. The advantages to a woman of abusing the system are many and myriad, and the disadvantages virtually nil. By the time a man has cleared his name, the children are often completely alienated from him, 
Family court judges will go so far as to admit that a mother has abused her own children through her abusive process, but will hesitate to penalize her in any way. She will almost certainly retain custody because it would harm the children uh, to place them in the care of someone they have been taught to fear and hate. She, uh, because she retains custody, if she's prosecuted, the children will suffer. If she's forced to pay damages, the children will suffer. If she's financially penalized in the settlement, the children will suffer. In extreme cases, judges have completely and permanently stripped a man's rights to his children, explaining that the mother's persistent combativeness uh, and repeated false allegations and abusive process had made it so that upholding that man's parental rights would only subject the children to more of their mother's abuse. And while not every woman, thank goodness, is going to take advantage of a system specifically weaponized for her use, the ex-wife of a friend of mine did mention to him recently that she was proud she'd never availed herself of any of these measures during their divorce, despite three court-appointed officials encouraging her to make a false claim of domestic violence and thereby gain the upper hand in their divorce process. Feminist models of gender and domestic violence have institutionalized the assumption that all men are batterers or potential batterers, that dominating, controlling, and abusing their female partners and their children is just part of what it means to be a man. They've institutionalized an assumption of non-culpability on the part of women even when they are openly abusing their husbands, ex-husbands, and children, and even when they abuse the court system in order to do it. In 85% of divorce cases in the US, mothers receive primary physical custody. The remaining 15% represent sole, paternal, and shared physical custody arrangements. The average cost to a man in a contested custody battle in the US is over $200,000. It can take up to six years of expensive court battles for a man to secure even regular access or shared custody, let alone primary physical custody. He may be required to pay his ex-partner's legal bills in addition to his own, pay for court-ordered assessments and services required for his case, and through the battle, he will also be required to pay maintenance to his ex-partner in the form of alimony and or child support, and in some cases, even pay the fees of the third party required for supervised visitation with his children. Is it any wonder that in the year immediately following a family breakup, men are 11 times more likely to commit suicide than women are. According to the Michigan chapter of the National Organization of Women, fathers' rights groups are an abuser's lobby. And the official stance of the chapter is to oppose any and all reforms that would normalize equal or near equal shared custody after divorce if neither parent is unfit. They oppose these measures in part because they say it would put women and children in danger from abusive and controlling former spouses, and in part because it would have unintended negative impacts on child support awards. This despite the off-stated feminist claim that cultural assumptions that women are automatically better caregivers are sexist against women, and despite the fact that the environment in which a child is at the highest risk of suffering abuse is in the care of a single mother. This is the influence of politicized ideological feminism in the areas of domestic violence and family law. And while society has always placed a greater priority on protecting women than men from violence and abuse, feminists have managed to rewrite a lot of history and completely flip public perceptions of human interaction in order to justify ever more intrusive government mechanisms that protect women from even their own criminal behavior and curtail the rights and civil liberties of the men who find themselves at the mercy of the system after having done nothing wrong. Over the last 40 years, a growing number of researchers have challenged feminism's theory of gender conflict and the conceptual framework of Duluth. These researchers have been subjected to blacklisting, career sabotage, intimidation, profes professional shunning, and even death threats. Family violence researcher Suzanne Steinmetz had a bomb threat called into her daughter's wedding. Erin Pitsy, the woman who established the first battered women's shelter in the world, lived for years under police protection due to threats to herself, her children, and her grandchildren from radical feminists, and finally fled the UK after her family dog was killed. All for daring to say 
that women are as violent as men within their relationships and that partner abuse is not a natural function of masculine identity, but a gender neutral social problem caused primarily by witnessing or experiencing abuse during childhood. To prove women are not violent, feminists have engaged in campaigns of violence and threats. And to prove society is male dominated, feminists have engaged in a pattern of malfeasance, silencing other voices, allowing themselves to remain the dominant authority on all gendered issues. And they evidently see no irony in any of that. The fiscal, social, and human costs of these policies are staggering. We treat every domestic violence accusation, indeed even the hint that a woman is afraid of her partner, with a better safe than sorry attitude that, incur that engages multiple bureaucracies. Taxpayers and beleaguered men pay thousands upon thousands of dollars for investigations, assessments, psychiatric evaluations, lawyers, expensive legal proceedings, incarcerations and prosecutions, a growing number of which end with the discovery that a woman was lying for revenge or personal gain. Children are mercilessly fragged by combative mothers, deprived often permanently of what may be their only stable parent. And fathers are ground into the dust. Intervention programs run by government funded agencies apply a single ideologically tainted treatment to a multifaceted problem, curing citizens of diseases they don't have while allowing their actual problems to fester. Cumbersome legal procedures, no drop policies, predominant aggressor policies, institutional legal and informal biases all contribute to a bill that is increasingly impossible for taxpayers to afford and that is handicapping the ability of children, future taxpayers who will be stuck with the growing mass of red ink to shoulder that debt. Fatherless children, an epidemic of whom we are creating with these policies, are more prone to a whole host of social maladies. They are at two to ten times the risk of being physically or sexually abused, becoming teenage parents, dropping out of school, be being behaviorally disordered, becoming involved in gangs, uh, being addicted to drugs or alcohol, being expelled from school, committing suicide, not going to college, committing crimes, being incarcerated, requiring welfare or food stamps, contracting sexually transmitted diseases, and being victims of violence. In fact, fun fact, if you control for fatherlessness, the race disparity among US prisoners incarcerated disappears. This is a problem of snowballing costs that will only worsen with each generation as government gets more bloated and top heavy while simultaneously crippling the ability of future generations to support it. It is a system where we examine the reading scores of eight year old boys, not to determine how to help boys stop flunking out of school, but to determine how many new prisons we need to build. It is a system wherein a man who is laid off temporarily and unable to pay his child support is systematically stripped of his driver's license, his professional licenses, and then thrown in debtor's prison, saddled with a criminal record, rendering him permanently unable to pay it, and where we will metaphorically chop a man's arms off and then tell him he'd better still shovel for all he's worth or he'll be sorry. And behind all of this, you will find radical feminist lobbyists pushing for further reforms for women to undo millennia of oppression of women that never existed in the way they believe it did. And regardless of the collateral damages to other members of society, they do this in the name of liberating women from the oppression of their historical dependence on, on men by constructing enormous government bureaucracies, ever growing in power and scope, funded disproportionately by men and upon which women in general have become just as dependent as they ever were on any man. All for the purpose of ending oppression. Because as we all know, no government anywhere has ever oppressed anyone. That's it for me. I'm done? Superb. Thank you. Oh, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, we have time for a few questions, so absolutely, shoot them at us. Go ahead. Do not oppress. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really, a retired judge I know was at a judicial convention in, in New York, and he was asked about the Supreme Court's presentation. Would you consider it justified in order to give the woman a tactical advantage to fabricate an incident for violence? And she, she simply admitted yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he thought, well, that should be enough for the judges to know that. Oh, yeah. No, I think, I think really, I think the entire system is aware. Um, it's aware, it's one of those things that's sort of just understood and, and nobody really talks about. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you look at it, and yeah, men tend to do more damage. Uh, one of the, the interesting facts is that uh, for both men and women, the more serious injuries tend to happen when they're both hitting each other, right? Also, um, the, these things do get turned around, because once these mechanisms are in place, I know a woman who went on disability, couldn't support herself, wound up living with her, her parents, and the husband then sues for child support, she spent 30 days. It's the law of unintended consequences. Uh, it, one of the, the provisions in the Violence Against Women Act uh, about immigration uh, is now biting more women in the behind uh, as far as uh, f them getting married to foreign nationals, bringing them here. And uh, what that act actually does is if you make an accusation, you, just, you don't have to prove it, you just have to make an accusation, a formal accusation of domestic violence, as a foreign national who's a spouse of an American citizen, um, not only are you entitled to all kinds of uh, financial assistance and, and all of that, but you get fast-tracked uh, for citizenship. You get permanent residence status, and you're fast-tracked for citizenship. And, uh, and yeah, who would have thought that this might incentivize people to do horrible things like that? You know, it's, and more women. I think about one in seven now of the victims of that particular form of immigration fraud are women. And they're pretty much, I think it'll have to be two out of seven before anybody cares, so. Go ahead. I, you know, they don't really talk too much about, like, what it seems to, what seems to be the repeating pattern is that they, they hate the patriarchy, but they want the police to protect them, and they want the court system to punish people who harm women, and, and they, you know, they basically, they hate the system, uh, but they want to use it in every way possible, and, and they're supposedly for individual empowerment, but, you know, women shouldn't have to do anything to protect themselves. You know, so I mean, it doesn't make any sense. That's the point I want to make is, uh, when you describe this, how, how women abuse and support this, and the, the, the domestic violence thing, and then the men's forces to corrupt the issue, what would happen if gay marriage becomes legal for young men? I mean, you know, you could exponentially increase this, this situation. There's a lot of talk in the men's movement because one of the few things, like one of the things most people really don't know is that uh, levels of violence among lesbian couples are actually higher than among heterosexual couples. And uh, so, and I was, I was actually at the National Organization of Women Conference last year and they had a lesbian speaker uh, talking about the Violence Against Women Act and, uh, and she, she basically, she was saying, well, you know, we, we need to ungender the language in the act because it does not serve my community. The idea of a male perpetrator is not going to serve a lesbian couple and the idea of a female victim is not going to serve a gay couple. And uh, so we need to sort of try and undo all of this assumption of, of it being sexually directional uh, in, in the wording of the act so that we can get these people the help they need. But at every, it was like this stone cold icy silence in the room, right? And then, uh, and then she says, oh, but of course, of course, domestic violence is a gendered problem. She just kind of adds, and then the applause starts, right? You know, it's, <laughs> it, it just, it boggles the mind. So, yeah, um, I do think that, that maybe there will be a fair template uh, in once gay marriage is illegal, once same-sex marriage is illegal, a fair template for breaking up marriages and for, for the divorce process and all of that, maybe. Uh, go ahead. You have a website in, in 
Um, I'm, I have a YouTube channel and I have a blog, and I'm soon to have, I have a website under construction at the moment. Um, Could you send me a copy of that talk? Well, here's what we'll do. We'll put that up. I'll, I'll spread it. Around. Yeah. We'll, the easiest probably will be for Karen to get the info to Gary. Yeah. And then I, I will blast. I don't know if anybody in this room has ever received an email from talk me. On a but I, will, I will blast it around to my usual two dozen lists. Okay. And, and Dr. Silberger will get at least five copies. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, we have time for just a couple more. Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, you? Uh, in the back? Yeah. Um, there was, and I wish I could remember her name. Mm -hmm. And she wrote, Who Stole Feminism? And it was because Christina Hoff Summers. That's it, Christina Hoff Summers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she found, one of the problems is that mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, there were a lot of women who were wondering what the heck happened when um, they've had sons but not daughters, and they're fighting the school system. And uh, you know, so that, that was one of the things that was found there, and, and she, she was, when she approached it, she found that these women were get if they're looking out for their son, then the bias against boys in the school system. It just, it's that. so clear, yeah. I mean, you, you even look at, in I think it was the New York Times uh, just last week, a feminist named Judith Grossman wrote an article about uh, her son his experience with an accusation, she couldn't come out and say it was a false accusation because there's really no way to know or to prove that. But our, her son in college, uh, at a liberal arts college, had been accused of sexual misconduct by his ex-girlfriend. And this, this incident that she was accusing him of had apparently happened two, two and a half years prior to the accusation being made. And the way uh, Title IX works now, uh, there was a, a dear colleague letter that came down from the Office of uh, Equal Rights or Civil Rights or whatever, uh, OCR in the Department of Education, uh, that all universities now in sexual misconduct cases uh, are to use the preponderance of the evidence standard and uh, rather than the beyond a reasonable doubt, rather than even clear and convincing, they want 50.01% sure that it probably happened, then yeah, he's expelled. And on top of that, there's no right uh, for an accused to ask questions of his accuser. Sometimes there's not even a right for him to know that person's name, who, who it was. Order, this, like this was, well, it was by executive, it was by, it came down from the Office of Civil Rights, uh, from, uh, it, it is in effect because basically what, what the deal was is if you don't institute these procedures, you, we, you don't get any more federal funding. And I think there's, what, two universities in, in the country that, that don't receive federal funding. So everybody's got to do it. And this, this feminist, she's, she's saying, how could this have happened? You know, I, she opens her article with, I, I've been a feminist for 30 years and I was marching at the barricades and, you know, I've been an activist this whole... It's been 40 years of reform to, reforms to uh, processes, legal processes in sexual assault cases in the criminal courts, all over the place, uh, all kinds of new rules of inadmiss inadmissibility or admissibility depending on, uh, on the jurisdiction as far as like makes sexual assault cases completely different from any other criminal case. And she's wondering, oh, how could this have happened to my boy? And I'm thinking, well, because you, you were part of bringing it about. like. So, uh, I just like to point out the irony that uh, one of the people who the change in evidentiary uh, rules affected uh, was a guy named Bill Clinton, who uh, suddenly his entire sexual history became relevant because he signed the law. Yeah, but you may you may not even be able to ask his accuser if you know. Oh, well, okay, so. Did you speak to him before he? You, know, you can't even ask her any questions. But he signed the law that they used against him. Oh, one of the most absurd things is that, uh, as far as inadmissibility of of a an accuser's uh, sexual history, if she has a history of making false accusations, that's not admissible <laughs> as part of her sexual history. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know, at, the, 
Your subject of discussion today, I was particularly not interested in when you started, mm. but you really got my attention by the end. Well, and, what it, and you're a real inspiration because what you have done is you have opened my eyes to something I just pay no attention to. I yeah. Didn't care about. Even Gary said when when said to me that when people would talk about these problems that they were having before he started having his problems with, with the breakup, the divorce, the family court, and custody, uh, he said they would start talking about and my eyes would just glaze over. And uh, like I just, your head just turns into a newborn baby. You're just like, oh, I want to pay attention, but it just, it's, yeah. But you have to, I think a lot of men have to experience it. And even sometimes they will go through it and then they will still swear up and down that the system's fair and that it's really not and that they're not a victim of anything. And it's, yeah. It's more than that because, you know, there must be similar things happening in all sorts of aspects of people's lives. Oh, yes. The one you're talking about. Yeah. Lots of ways for people to question their assumptions of the past, you know, yeah. that we don't do. And I applaud you for uh, rekindling an interest in this. Oh, well, thank you. Go ahead. Um, I'm not sure how to say this. Mm-hmm. My, my sister is actually in the military. She does, uh, she administers, uh, she's an administrator of medical services in the Canadian military. And uh, she said that uh, when they actually do surveys of their personnel as far as domestic violence incidents and stuff, uh, any kind of violence uh, that anybody perpetrates is going to be uh, more likely to happen uh, if they have PTSD, um, if they've been just psychologically damaged by having to go to war. If there are no services available for them to help them, you know, get on an even keel again and help them recover, this is one of the things that I find just absolutely heartbreaking. Is uh, is how we, you know, the, the statement "I love my country, but my country doesn't love me," you know, and that soldiers will discover this when they come back from being deployed that there's just very, very little available to them to help them. I don't think that there's any man who wants to hurt his his partner or his children. I don't think that there are any uh, women who really want to hurt 